Um, so we're going to do a quick demo here on ID Manager. Um, this is actually the solution that you guys are uh, using right now to connect to the network. Um, all right. This is going to be a much quicker and less involved demo uh, than what Kel was showing. <laughs> I know you appreciate that, Joel. <laughs> so um, ID Manager um, is our guest-enabled uh, uh, or cloud-enabled guest management application. Um, so all that you need to, to have in order to run ID Manager is a MyHive account. Um, this is useful. This is usable for both HMOL as well as on-premise customers. Again, even though we're you know pushing kind of a cloud-first sort of strategy, we're committed to making the same features and functions available both for public and private cloud. Now this is the administrator view. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of elements in this, and then we're going to go over to what the end users actually see when they're registering, because for guest management in general, it's mostly about how easy and quickly uh, you can get your guests on board. Um, so uh, home configuration screen gives you an overview of your network and your configuration. Um, monitoring uh, gives you all of the uh, identity and usage information off of your network. Um, one of the things about current uh, guest solutions is they tend to drop the identity part of everything. So you've got a bunch of anonymous people on your network. You don't really know what they're doing. If you have some need for forensic auditing after the fact, uh, the best case you're going to be able to do is MAC address. Um, and again, this comes through because you're trying to balance convenience and ease of use um, versus all of these other considerations. And for overburdened IT departments, this generally means a click to accept uh, EULA on an open SSID um, and let them run amok on the internet. What we can do with ID Manager is we can actually enforce an identity verification for people and provide encrypted guest access. Um, and so as you can see in our accounting log here, um, all of the keys that everybody put in this morning, um, everybody's login name is showing up. We can see when they connected, when they disconnected, upload, download, etc. Um, so that's kind of an idea of the, the background uh, accounting information we can do. Just one question. Is it sure. tracking George's downloading files? <laughs> Actually, if you look at who's number one, it's not George this time. It's, <laughs> oh, it's Tom, Tom this time. George's email's gone way down. Oh, no. Andrew. Actually, <laughs> Andrew? Yeah. Andrew's in the lead. I'm multitasking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's actually got a couple of them, too. Multi-threading? Yeah. Right behind you. So those stats are updated in real time, as you can see. Um, the configuration is very simple. Um, you have a, a basic definition of guest types. Uh, within those guest types, um, you can define parameters for when the guests are going to access. Um, this is all information that the network administrator would set up once ahead of time. Um, and uh, let's see. So. Uh, these accounts get generated. They can use credentials or they can use Arrowhive's private PSK. Um, how many people here are not familiar with private PSK? Good. <laughs> we can keep this shorter. Um, so uh, each one of you having your own private PSK means we can attach an identity to you on the network. Um, that identity can be attached to a user profile. That's what's defined here. Um, the account durations are very flexible. Um, we can have things set up so that they expire a certain amount of time from the first time the key is used to connect to the network, as well as from start date, end date, et cetera. All right, let's move over to the registration UE. Um, this is what the end users will see in one form or another. The network administrator has uh, control over you know, the background colors, some basic formatting options, as well as which registration methods are available at any given time. Um, the, we're logged in right now as my administrator account, so we're actually going to be able to see all of them. But the administrator can create delegated authority accounts for like uh, your receptionist or somebody else to be able to generate accounts. That could have a, a simplified version of this. Uh, you can create accounts, well, simplified as in maybe they don't register groups, right? Maybe they're registering individuals only. Um, you can also create uh, dedicated kiosks. Um, so uh, kiosk mode basically uh, logs in on a web page that has a forced login where there's only one profile available. It's basically for at the front desk self-registration. Um, and then... Uh, now let's, let's just start walking through and register a guest here, okay? So we pick, uh, again, administrator has control over which guest types are available. We're going to say it's an attendee. Let's say Tosh. 
Epting, representing self. Um, here to visit was automatically populated with my credentials because I was the person who was logged in when I did that. Um, we also have the ability to do employee sponsorship. Um, so you can delegate credential authentication to an Active Directory server, in which case the employee would be logging into the ID Manager website with their Active Directory credentials, and that would auto-populate with the uh, employee's uh, email address uh, who is doing the registering. Yeah, we got a, a, had an interesting conversation with the customer about that particular feature where they were like, well, does that mean that the Cloud ID Manager is talking directly to my Active Directory? And we're like, no, it's the APs that you've deployed on site that are talking to Active Directory that's just proxying it through the ID manager. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, some people are, are concerned about what does this mean for my firewall configuration, right. right? Do I have to open up holes in my firewall to allow incoming connections from the internet? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, we use a RADSEC proxy. Um, so uh, just like you would do for 802.1x authentication on an Arrowhive network, um, one of the access points is joined into Active Directory. Um, also, within a given uh, network, when you have ID Manager turned on, one of those access points is going to open an SSL tunnel back to the ID Manager website, and all the communications between the, the APs and ID Manager are going to happen over that encrypted tunnel. Um, and basically, for the 802.1x authentication, we're just doing it in the reverse direction and, and proxying the authentication in Active Directory. So before you leave this page, I sure. have to ask, is there any kind of provision for bulk creation of a There's bulk provisions in the back end. You can either download a template uh, XLS spreadsheet, pre-populate that with credentials, or if you don't really care what the usernames are per se, there's a literal bulk create option where you can type in a prefix, uh, tell it I want to create 20 of these guys, and it'll just increment a number on the end of them. Um, and then you can you know, download that as a spreadsheet or print it out afterwards. Or you can get it emailed to the administrator who's setting it up with a list yeah, of the Yeah, with a list of all of them, yep. yep. So, uh, email address, I'll go ahead and put in my email. We did that. <laughs> we had that now, another there. nice thing about this solution, um, yes, everything is correct, is our options for notifying. Now, as I was saying before, part of what you're doing to actually attach an identity to these guest users is you need to make sure that the keys they use to access the network are delivered out of band, that you're not just displaying it on the screen. <laughs> you have to prove that you know, they, they did, in fact, access the keys through whichever method this is. Now, you don't have to do it that way if you don't want to. So we do have provisions that you can turn on for displaying it on the screen. We have provisions for enabling printing if you're doing this as a front desk kiosk and you don't really care about that as much. But we also allow SMS, email, and Twitter DM notifications. Now, an another thing to keep in mind, when we're talking about simplifying um, with cloud-enabled applications, um, SMS is a perfect example of this, uh, because normally, if you were trying to set up your own uh, guest gateway with SMS authentication, then you're, you've got a back end you've got to worry about with your SMS gateway. You've got to figure out how that's configured services, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> um, you hit a checkbox that say, I want to enable SMS authentication, you're done. Um, we handle everything on the back end with the SMS authentication. We pay for the text messaging fees. It's done. So, quick question on that. I do something similar, but I run into the service I use runs into problems like dealing with, um, you know, like Canadian carriers. Do you have anything like that? Any issues I, like that? I am uncertain. Like um, the gateways I, they use? I can go ahead and check into that. I know that we currently aren't, enable, aren't able to send SMSs to Google Voice accounts. Um, and that's fairly common with a lot of gateways. Um, but I can check in on the, uh, the Canadian carriers. So when we launched the product, um, one of the things we did for SMS testing was we went to all of our salespeople in whatever region they were in and said, we'd like you to help us test this new function, which you want to do because it helps us sell the product. And we do have a sales team in Canada. Um, they are on different carriers even. And they both successfully received text messages. Um, the at the very beginning screen, there's the drop down for the country code, mm -hmm. and that is all of the countries that we test in. Okay. Others may work, but those are the ones that we guarantee work. Right. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and prove my identity through Twitter. So my Twitter handle is Slipshod. Access key sent. So now. 
Would the end user have to go and follow the ID manager first? The end user uh, does have to follow it first, and if you are not currently following, uh, it, it'll give you an error message here that reminds you that you need to go follow it. So you have the opportunity to go back and send it again or pick a different method. So if you're getting on here, it's because you don't have access which you don't have access to go in and follow it. Yes and no. Uh, depends on the device. If you're talking about a mobile device, that might not necessarily be the case. And you could be getting a key for your laptop and pulling the key off of your mobile device. So there are use cases that work. Perfectly valid, there are use cases that don't work, which is why we have a, a wide variety of notification methods, whether they're, you know, because email, if you don't have connectivity, you're not going to have email either. Um, so SMS would work in that case. So you can fall back to printing, you know. And keep in mind, you can just display it on the screen, yeah. right? And yeah, it all depends on what you're trying one. to do. <clears throat> so let us go over to Kind of surprised Twitter. we didn't DM all of our... And then I've got a DM waiting because for me bad. from oh, Arrowhive yeah, ID Manager. You guys almost got an email last night. It was just, can you please follow this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, as you can see, it uh, tells you what the SSID is, tells you what the key is, and then gives you a brief summary of what it's currently configured for how long you can access. Uh, if it's a date-based access method, it's going to show you that as well. So you would have to be following like, Arrowhive ID Manager to get the... <coughs> have to be following Arrowhive ID Manager. If you are not following and you say that you want to receive your key through uh, direct message, um, it will detect that you're not following. It'll error tell you to either follow or try a different Ooh. method. Very cool. Yeah. So we do have a safety net for that. Okay. All right. Any other questions about ID Manager? Separate product? Separate cost? Uh, separate product. Um, in your MyHive account, you can go in, sign up for a free trial, uh, turn it on, play with it. Um, the backend configuration in Hive Manager is similarly simplified as it is with client management, um, where for the most part, it's hitting a checkbox on an SSID that says that you're uh, going to use ID Manager. Um, you need to pick, is this SSID going to be PPSK? Um, or, or, you know, if, if it's open and you say you're going to use ID Manager, then you set up Captive Web Portal like you would normally, pick the self reg one, and voila, you have a self reg Captive Portal that works with ID Manager. So how does this go against the Arrowhive has no feature licenses? <laughs> so what we're doing is we're adding additional products to the line, is basically the way so we're So it's not a it. feature, it's a new product. It's a new it's product that's tightly integrated tightly with integrated. the ex existing wireless LAN system, yes. And actually, this... The product, we do have the ability to function as a radius server over the internet for third-party authentications as well. Um, you obviously lose features like PPSK, um, but if you have another set of access points and you're willing to you know, configure their radius server for ID Manager, we support that so you can get a lot of the benefits from that. Again, but not all of them and not the tight integration. There's one other thing about it being a product and not a feature license, which is that a feature license is a a cost you pay per AP. So if you have one AP or 10,000 APs, ID Manager costs the same. It's You're buying an application for your network. You're not uh, paying for every AP you add to your network to join the application. So the client product is, you pay for that by client? Yes. Yes. And so ID Manager, you don't pay for by usage? It's just a single one-time shot? Um, so it's, there are levels of the number of guest accounts that you define. And so there's tiered pricing based on that. Um, but there's, there's no usage-based charge to that. Yeah, it doesn't matter to us whether you have five APs using it for guest management or 10,000 APs. So one is you pay for by number of guests or number of clients or number of APs. Well, we don't sell anything by the number of APs, right? We don't. We don't Except have any. We don't have APs. feature list, right? It's not like you say, <laughs> oh, in order to get firewall, you have to have this license oh, but, on every but device. The Hive OS is you, you pay for Hive Manager online by APs. By the AP. So not, that, that not has the AP devices. count, client manager has client count, and guest manager has guest count. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good way of thinking of it. Don't forget our routers and switches. I have, have a follow on <laughs> I have a follow on for that. Okay. How does it count guests? Because you've got guest accounts, you've got PPSK accounts that you can stick in ID Manager, and I'm like, I can't figure out how it works out against the license, how many accounts. So how many accounts are currently able to be authenticated on the system? So if you've generated a bunch of accounts um, and people have not signed in for them yet, mm -hmm. those count against the count. Okay. Um, so it's not simultaneously on the system. 
It's guest accounts that are currently, if they've expired, they're out. So right? Guest and PPSK accounts that are actually in the system. Yes. Only PPSK accounts that are being managed by IDM. You could have a second SSID and have manual PPSKs on that all over the place, whatever you want to do. It's specifically just the ones that are being managed by IDM. Okay. Does it get licensed in blocks, or how does that work? Uh, yes. Yeah, block. Okay. And what happens when I reach the limit on the count? Do I get, as an administrator? Your cloud range. Yeah. <laughs> Does it just start to rain? Does, uh, I, can't create I know no there's some warning or... messages. I'm not entirely sure what the error message that gets set or what happens on, on the end user interface. I can look that up and get back to you on that. Okay. 